Maybe just to, to start off, to remind ourselves, let's write down what are Maxwell's equations. So will somebody tell, so I want you guys to tell me what are Maxwell's equations. Divergence of B is zero, good. Ishmael, what does this equation tell us? There's no source for the magnetic field. That means there's no point where the magnetic field lines start and there's no point where the magnetic field lines end. Equivalently, there are no <coughs> magnetic monopoles. Very good. Okay, next one. Good. Al-Zahara, what does this equation tell us? Good. And it starts on positive or negative? Uh, starts on positive and ends on negative. Good. Another one? Great. So, to come, first of all, what does this one tell us? Changing magnetic field creates an electric field. Good. Can you tell me something more about the electric field lines? Or closed. Good. So whenever you see a closed electric field line, it's due to a changing magnetic field. Whenever you see an open electric field line that starts somewhere and ends somewhere, it's due to a charge. Good. Okay, good. 1 over C squared, great. D, E, D, T. Good. Um, what does this equation tell us? Magnetic fields. Good. A current will set up a magnetic field or changing electric field will set up a magnetic field. And whatever magnetic field you set up, it always is a closed field line. Okay? Good. Um, what is this equation called? Gauss law? Faraday's law? Ampere's law? By Maxwell. Good. So those are the Maxwell equations. We need one more equation for um, electrodynamics, which is the force that a charged particle feels. Should I also write down charge conservation? By Maxwell's equations. So if you combine actually the fourth and the second, you'll get charge conservation. So we don't need to require charge conservation independently. It's already in these equations. Good. Now, we have been solving, we have been solving the source free Maxwell equations. Maxwell's equations. And when we say source free, we mean we set rho equal to zero and j equal to zero. So this was naught and that term we dropped. We were solving those equations. And um, yesterday we had in fact obtained a solution. And the solution that we had, had obtained, let me write it in the notation of yesterday. Um, The electric field depended on only Z and T. And in fact, the electric field only had an X component. The magnetic field also 
depended only on z and t. And um, that only had a y component. Good. Z and T. And um, we had managed to solve for those two functions. So if you remember, um, EX, we said, was F1 of X plus plus F2 of X minus and BY was f2 of x minus plus f1 of x plus divided by c, the speed of light. Sorry? Oh, where's the minus? Very good. Thank you, Ishmael. Now, let's put in what are x plus and x minus. x plus and x minus, or z plus or minus ct. So I think that that's what we had derived yesterday. OK. Now, um, <clears throat> let's start to study some properties of the solution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set one of these functions equal to 0 just for simplicity and study uh, only one arbitrary function. So I'm going to say, let's, for example, set f1 is equal to 0. If we set f1 is equal to 0, x is f2 of x minus and by is f2 of x minus divided by c. And I would like to understand what do these solutions mean? What is the physical interpretation of the solution? So what is the physics? of this solution. OK. So first of all, let me pick my function. So let's imagine that f2 is the following. So I'm going to plot f2 as a function of a, let's say. Perhaps it looks like that. Okay. What we will see is f2 is some sort of a wave. It was a solution for a wave equation. Uh, if I want to figure out how fast the wave is going, what should I do? So, so let's say that we're on the beach and we see a wave moving. And I want to work out how fast is the wave moving. One thing I could do is run next to the wave. And I'll stay next to the height of the wave. And if I run fast enough that I stay next to the height of the wave, and I see how fast I'm going, does everyone agree, agree that that'll give me the speed of the wave? So what I want to do is I want to sit on this point of the wave. Okay? I want to sit here. Let's say, I don't know, this is the point A is equal to 2. So I want to sit at A is equal to 2. And if I keep sitting at A is equal to 2, I will keep sitting at this height on the wave. Okay? Now let's take a look. I've got F2 of x minus. So I've got F2 of x minus, which is actually F2 of uh, z minus ct. So what does that mean? I must change my z coordinate as time changes so that z minus ct is always 2. Then I will always sit at the same point on the wave. 
Does everyone agree with that? Okay. So as time passes, I will keep running in such a way that z minus ct is always 2. And then what is the height of the wave that I see at my z and t? I will always see the same height for the wave. I'm running next to the wave. So let me take this equation and differentiate both sides with respect to t. If this is equal to that, the derivative with respect to t is equal to dz dt, that's going to be my speed. Minus c, dt dt is just 1, that's equal to 0. So if I now solve, dz dt is equal to c. So how fast do I have to move to keep up with the wave? Speed of light. So this is a wave that's moving at the speed of light. In which direction is it moving? Z, in the positive z direction. Okay, so if we think about the, uh, so, so let's maybe have z coming towards you guys, then there's x and here's y. The electric field points in the x direction. So there's the electric field pointing there. The magnetic field points up and the wave moves in that direction. So the direction of propagation, the direction of the electric field, the di direction of the magnetic field are all orthogonal. Okay. Now, in general, how can you tell the direction in which the wave is moving? We would calculate something called the pointing vector. Now, you've already seen that the field has some energy. What was the energy in the electric field, the energy density? Uh, epsilon zero. Half epsilon zero e squared. Good. In the same way that it has an energy density, there is also a momentum density, which tells you, you know, how the, the flow of this wave is. And that's given to you by something called the pointing vector. It'll tell you in which direction the wave is moving. So the pointing vector is defined as <coughs> E cross B. Let's calculate this for our problem. For our problem, E is just F2 of x minus x hat. Now we'll take the cross product with B. Uh, B is F2 of x minus over C times by y hat. So this gives us f2 of x minus squared over c. x hat cross y hat is z hat. So you can see it's pointing precisely in the direction that we are moving and its size is proportional to the mod of e squared which we know is, is related to the energy density. So this is telling us about the momentum that the field is carrying. Okay. Um, now, I want to ask you guys um, a question. Let's say we have a 100 watt bulb. If you have a 100 watt bulb, so it's giving out 100 watts of energy, there's light coming off that bulb. Now we know what light is. Light is this combination of electric fields and magnetic fields. What size is the electric field in that light? So we measure electric field in volts per meter. So when that electric field leaves the light, when that light leaves the bulb, that light is a set of electric and magnetic fields. I want to know, let's imagine we stand one meter away from the bulb. How big do you think the electric field is one meter away from the bulb? So the electric field is in volts per meter. Can you guys make a suggestion? How big do you think that electric field is? So light that we see is a combination of electric and magnetic fields. We've learned something about electric fields. How big do you think those electric fields are? Small. Okay, Ishmael, give me a number. 
So how many volts per meter? Any idea? Anybody have an idea? Is it a nanovolt per meter? Is it a microvolt per meter? A volt per meter? What's a reasonable electric field? Nano. Nanovolt per meter. Okay. Tacong? Nanovolts per meter. I want another one, An another estimate. Who's some? Volts per meter. Okay, so this is a billion times bigger. <laughs> Does somebody else, uh, guys? You, now you shouldn't be scared to give me a number. <laughs> We've got two numbers. There's a difference of a billion between them. Emil, you give me the third number. Okay, good. Muzi. Millivolts per meter. Okay? So we can see uh, Muzi's confidence. Um, He's prepared to go a factor of a thousand away from Husam, but a factor of a million away from Tukong. So now we've got all of our bases covered. One uh, nano, one milli. So let's see how big it is. Okay. Um, good. You guys told me so, so, in fact, the Kong reminded me that the energy density for the electric field is equal to 1 over 2 epsilon naught E dot E. Okay? Now, we didn't derive it, but I'm just going to tell you now. The energy density for the magnetic field looks very similar. There's also a one half. There's also a B dot B. What do you think goes here? One, one, over. one over mu naught. Good. One over mu naught. So those look very, very similar. I want you guys to take. There is our electric field. There is our magnetic field. Take the electric field and the magnetic field and work out what is the energy density for both of them. And I want to know which one is bigger. So let's call this the energy density of the electric field, the energy density of the magnetic field. I want to know which one is bigger, rho E or rho B. And uh, there is your E and B. They've got F2s appearing and you've got C appearing. Can someone remind me what is C in terms of mu naught and epsilon naught? Good.
So rho e epsilon naught over 2 f2 squared. Rho b 1 over 2 mu naught. Now let's square that. f2 squared over c squared. What does c squared equal to? 1 over mu naught epsilon naught. So what do you find this term is equal to? Epsilon naught f2 squared over 2. So rho e is equal to rho b. Did everyone get that? You mean Oh, so rho, okay, is just the energy density. So remember before we calculated the energy density and we found it was this value? So the one half epsilon naught is just sitting there. And then we want E dot E. E is E x x hat and E x is F2. So F2 x hat dotted F2 x hat is F2 squared. Happy with that? And the same thing then for the magnetic field. So what we learn is the energy density carried by the magnetic field is equal to the energy density carried by the electric field, okay, for light. They, those two fields carry the same energy density. Good. Now, Let's imagine that, um, so, so, okay, so what does that mean? The energy density for light, which is equal to the energy density for the electric field plus the energy density for the magnetic field, we can write this as epsilon naught E dot E. Is everyone happy with that? I just added the two contributions together. I know they're equal. For just the electric field, it would have been one half epsilon naught E dot E. The second term is equal to this one, so when I sum them, that's what I get. Everyone happy with that? Good. Okay. So now, um, what I would like to know is so. Imagine we have something like um, uh, the sun shining down. It could be a light bulb, it could be the sun, anything. So there is our source of light. There is the light coming out. And somewhere over here we have a screen. And this screen has an area of one meters squared. Okay? Actually, for now, let's leave it general. Let's say a meter squared. That's no problem doing that. Maybe the formula will look a bit clearer. And, and the question I want to ask myself is, how much energy passes the screen every second. So how much energy passes the screen every second? Now, if you want to calculate that, how fast does light move? That's speed c, right? So in one second, how much light will pass that screen? Any light that will distance 
all of the light inside this box will pass that screen. Where this side, how long is that side? C. C. Because in one second, light that is just here will manage to get just that side of the screen. So this is a box whose length is C, but the area of the side of the box is A. So what's the volume of that box? C A. So if we want to get the amount of energy passing the screen, we should take the volume and multiply by the energy density. And the energy density is epsilon naught e dot e. So the amount of energy passing the screen is the energy density times the volume and um, <clears throat> the energy density we've calculated epsilon naught e dot e the volume is C times by A good Ah, okay. So Ishmael, I've, I've secretly got the density for the magnetic field in there. Because what's happened is, you agree the energy density for light is the sum of those two. So rho E would be one half epsilon naught E dot E plus the energy density for the magnetic field would be one over two mu naught B dot B, right? But on the top board, we proved that these two terms were equal. So we can write this as one half epsilon naught e dot e plus the two terms are equal one half epsilon naught e dot e. I sum them, I get epsilon naught e dot e. So after I've expressed uh, this quantity in terms of e, I'll be able to estimate the magnitude of e. You could equally well, instead of writing everything as epsilon naught e dot e, if you like, you could also express it as 1 over mu naught b dot b. And by doing that calculation, you'll be able to estimate what is the magnitude of the magnetic field. Okay? Good. Okay. So if I'm calculating the amount of energy per second, okay, um, so what is the amount of energy per second? What, are we quanti what quantity are we calculating? Power. So if we work out the power per unit area, we need to take the power that we've obtained and divide by a. Very good. So this will be nothing but um, epsilon naught e dot e times by c. Good. Epsilon naught times by c, I'm just going to use the expression that we know for c. c is 1 over the square root of epsilon naught mu naught. So this gives us the square root of epsilon naught over mu naught e dot e. And, um, okay, so let's work out what is the value of epsilon naught over mu naught. Uh, 